Welcome back to Higher Density Living this beautiful morning in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, if you're a viewer here, you will see that uh, Jason and I have acquired a rather um, large size organite pyramid. I know. You can even feel it. Look at the, look how it's, uh, the smoke's going by it. Why is the smoke bending around it? Yeah, I know. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Um, well, it's like pulling it towards it. So, yeah, we're pretty psyched about this thing. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes to where you can get your own, and we would recommend it from here because it's off the original designs of the uh, gentleman who invented it. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. What are we going to discuss, Jason? I want to talk about, uh, I, I just kind of see it's, it's a funny word, but like spiritual schizophrenia. Um, and I want to get into the I am versus the me because we've been, we've been talking a lot about the tendency for you know, service to self, service to others right. in our Orion series. So kind of delving deep into understanding, I think y- until you can, you're, it's like an organic process to serve others. Should be. You shouldn't have to, I shouldn't force myself to say, you know what, I need to serve others. So right now I'm going to do this, this, and this. There should be this natural tendency of love to have this outpouring of love to serve others. And it's like, how do you, it's like, uh, for instance, fourth density, yep. that's I love you. That's correct. Sixth density is just complete oneness. Yeah, there's no, there's no, it's all love. You yeah. see what I'm saying? There's no separation of the self. No, there's not. And this is how I came to the realization, you know, deep within myself about this, you know, being kind as a practice. You yes. Have to, you have to practice being mindfulness, kind, yeah. right? But there's great benefits of joy, peace, and unity that come from being kind. But if you need an example of how obvious it is to align with creation and why you should be service to others, look at the sun. Just look at the sun. Not like have a staring contest with it and burn a hole in your cornea. What I'm saying is use it as an example. What does it do all day long? It shines constantly. It gives radiant energy and light that feeds this planet. Is the sun asking anything of you in return? It never ask. It, it doesn't, does it? It's constantly it gives. Constantly yeah. gives. It's been doing it for millions and millions and millions and millions of years. An unfathomable amount of time. And it has never stopped. Regardless of the people that came here and have touched the face of this planet between you know, all the different conquests and atrocities that have happened throughout mankind, it has never, ever stopped shining. It's in a constant state of giving. Why? Why does it give? It gives so other things can thrive and learn. Without it, we wouldn't be able to survive here, correct? You wouldn't have the opportunity to learn. So when you consider that and take that upon yourself, it's like, well, how can I be more like the sun? How can I be warm and radiant, make people feel good, give them opportunity for growth? Like if you're considering everyone else like a plant, right? And you want to radiate like the sun, they need that for photosynthesis. They need that catalyst for growth. They need that unifying wavelength that you are kind of setting through. Wouldn't you say that the sun is I am? In the sense... It's like well, there's oneness there. I, I get that, like you had said. But this is one, you know, like... I yeah. Mean, do, you, do you know <laughs> what I mean? Your, your hand motion. Please, you're doing a hand motion, but you have to explain to people what you're doing. Otherwise, they have no idea. This yeah, unless you're watching the video. Yeah, so yeah. give them some audio about what you mean with your hand motion. No, I mean, it's like just this level stream of consciousness of giving. That's all it does. Yeah. It has one, it, that it knows that the top tier thing it could ever do is just give constantly. But what does the sun do? Is the sun like a flashlight and it shines its beam in one direction? No, it doesn't. The sun shines in all directions, on all level, on all levels, on all wavelengths. But you, I don't want to get too deep into this, but when you put a refraction of water to that sun, light, then what happens? Yeah. And, yeah. What does it create? Well, the, it's, not, it's not what it's creating. No. No, when you, up, when you put wa- like water against it and it's re- reflecting off yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. Then what, create, what does it create? Well, it's, it's, cre- be- it's beautiful what? <laughs> rainbow yes yeah so <laughs> but it's but then we look at the rainbow but we don't we look at the rainbow and we we the identity is not the rainbow no that's just a reflection it's a reflection of this thing of unity what you're seeing is all the different things that sit within unity when you look at the refraction of light or propagation of light through a medium okay like going through a crystal and then it breaks it down away like the pink floyd album cover 
I always go back to that for Dark Side of the Moon. That's what you're looking at. But all of those together then become white light. All you're doing is you get to peer into unity for a moment. And you get to see how it structured itself. But don't you think that's a visual representation of us being in this high vibration of love and of giving? It creates... But we're not recognizing it, it like it's that, It creates Jason. this color spectrum of being able to bring red, yellow, purple... Together. Together in that frequency when it's specifically needed for that time. Right. And so if you look at people and, you know, they come from different races or backgrounds, mm -hmm. what does it matter about the skin color? Yes. They all sit within the same layers of spec, you know, spectrum of, you they're, know, they're all just a reflection of consciousness. It's all a reflection of this great creational consciousness. Yes. That's all it is. That's all it is. Nothing yeah. but that. But the question is, what the thing is, we look at the rainbow and we're like, oh, well, it seems like the red comes first, so it must be better than the purple. Because the purple comes last. But then what if I look at it from the other side? What if the purple comes first? How is it to say that anything is better than the other? It isn't. It's all about the way you view into unity at that moment as mm. a distortion of unity. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. So it is uh, your assumption of the experience. And that's what you're doing. You're assuming the experience. Or some people assume... Based off your limited little baby mind. Yeah, that's correct. And some people think there's a leprechaun at the end of that experience. <laughs> yeah, with some gold. Yeah, we yeah. always, always want to take something... That this is that's that's very important because we always want to take something that creation is just giving, and then we want to assume through our experience that we have the ability because there was abundance offered, we have the ability to take. That's a phenomenal through word. greed. You know, abundance is a great word, and when people think of abundance, they only think of it in the material sense. Yeah, but at the end of the rainbow, if you there's become, gold. There's plenty of people that are materially abundant but completely lacking internally within themselves. Right. They actually find no joy in life and they think that acquiring more is the best, but there is an abundance of learning. There is an abundance, you know, of knowledge, of wisdom, of light, all of these things that you actually need to actually be evolutive. How about this? Go ahead. There is an abundance of service available. That's exactly my point. There's an abundance of those experiences. The question is, do you want to look towards that abundance or are you going to focus on, I just need this next best thing? That's not what it is. You should always want to learn more. You should always look for that more difficult experience because there's great learning that happens in it and it's there. It's always shining through. The question is, are you going to actually put yourself in that rainbow, in that ray of light? And if you want to create positive, evolutive, unifying experiences for others around you, it makes sense then take on the form of a giving, take on the form of like this micro sun, right? Always shining, always radiant, always warmth, always sharing knowledge when it's asked for. Mm, yeah, like that. Only when the people are ready to receive it. I only want to come out in the sunlight if I choose to go outside and receive the sunlight. But I can stay underground. I can stay inside with the blinds down. It's only when you're choosing to receive it. But if I walk around all the time, the people will make that choice on their own time. It's a perfect service to others' per you know, personality. No, it, it, well, I mean, that's just that's just your free will, and we'll get into that. But go to the schizophrenia aspect of it, though. Yeah, so the I am versus me. Um, and I, I was uh, watching a video, because what I'm fixing to say, I want to make sure I give credit to him. It's that Benito Massina or whatever. I don't know how to spell his Benito name. Masada, but, but yeah. Benito Massada or whatever. But he was talking about um, there's a caricature of us, and there's a two. You know, at TWO. So, you know, whenever we begin to, you know, like even subconscious and conscious. Oh, yes. I know you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So whenever we begin to talk to ourselves, then we've created this too. He goes, even in, even in like spiritual teachings, there's like, I'm observing myself, you know, so there's this spiritual, there's this guy I want to be that's spiritually enlightened. And then there's the real me. You see what I'm saying? People tend to do that. And, and this is why, because I think this will help a lot of listeners, because we're always separating ourselves from and making it about me instead of the I am. We create our own paradox. Because the real you is not... There's no separation yeah. in the real you. you know, there's, it's timeless. It's eternal. And if you think you're talking to somebody else, you're not. You're talking to yourself. Mm -hmm. You're speaking with consciousness. Yeah. There's no other person in the room. It's just for the first time ever you realize that, oh, I can actually have a conversation with me. But pure consciousness and subconscious, what, we're, what we view as the subconscious in our mind yep. is just the, the subconscious is, is with our, if we close our eyes, we do, and we've talked about this before, touch, smell, hear, all these those things. Those are automatic responses. You take those away mm -hmm. and you have this limitless ability in the mind to be able to create 
um, experiences because yeah. it's we got we got to understand where it, it's. I, I always use the Matrix movie, but we got to understand we're creating these experiences in our our mind, in our conscious mind, our subconscious mind, and I'm saying you know in the brain, not in yeah. you know you know pure consciousness. If mm-hmm. that if that makes sense, that makes sense. Um, and then that creates the separation from you know, because we're third going into fourth density. Yes. That creates a separation. Sixth density, there is no subconscious. There is no, it's just pure it's, consciousness. It's just collective consciousness. Altogether. Yeah, yeah, it's collective You have no physical body to there's no, There's no subconscious I. automatic responses. There's no I, it's only we. Yeah, and, and so the, these raw teachings that we talk about so much, the law of one, the, and we're going to get into this tomorrow, but that w- that is, uh, if you want to use, we're, we even have to say this, which is true, which is false, a group of these consciousness because they're not a group they're one yeah they're one they understand the <laughs> the accelerated linear progression of unity mm. they understand that there is only one path to take so everybody needs to go on that one path for the evolution of all they are but a collective consciousness right it's all of these minds coming together and we don't have to we don't have to get into it right now but you know, that's a big focus of it. But when you look at that that idea of schizophrenia, right? It's it's like if I'm gonna use my consciousness to then not focus on these material experiences, I'm gonna start to, you know, move away from those senses and live with the internal sense of spirit that has been clouded with this material world, right? If I can do that through meditation, then it's not so much as me having a conversation. It's rather me listening. I am then receiving from the self. Your spirit, right, is a part of creation. It's constantly giving. The thing is, we do not choose to listen to it. Like if I choose to stay inside and not receive any sunlight, sunlight's always giving. Do I want to be outside though and be in it? Do I want that hormone balancer, right? Do I want that vitamin Mm, D? Yes. yes. question is, do I want that? Do I want something that balances out my consciousness? And the way I receive that is by quieting all those other things that are happening in the mind, that process of thoughts and those process of material feelings and all that stuff that's going on and just allow myself to listen and observe. Mm, And when I say listen, it's a listening of the consciousness to what the spirit is feeding all the time. It feeds perfect creational energy. So when you look at the question of me, right? What is me as opposed to I am? I am speaks more in the sense of an identification of the totality of creation itself but when i think of me it's strictly ego driven here's me this is for me i'm doing it for me but when you're saying you know if i take this with the focus of i am it's how do i choose to identify rather than say i'm only in this for my benefit i can now understand that there's something beyond that what do i choose to identify with so for us right now we look at the the stance of i am but for something from a six dimensional perspective they might be we am or we are that's that sort of collective mindset. And the thing is, you make that choice when you start to realize what that I am is, where the ego belongs, where the separation of thoughts belong, where the spirit actually resides, and that you don't have a higher self that you're speaking to. It's always there. Nothing is actually above you. We just conceptually use that idea as like, I need to speak to my higher self. There's no hierarchy when it comes to that. The spirit resides within you, and that is it. There's nothing else around it. You're the one that's just blocking that infinite stream of consciousness that is pouring through this creational energy through that spirit that you have. You choose to be schizophrenic. We have this weird idea of being schizophrenic. Think about when people go out in social groups. You're like, you know, why is Sally or Joe acting like that? They never act like that, right? Or, you know, in the context of your parents, you see them at a, you know, a dinner party with their friends, you know, you've just gotten to that age and you start to realize like, I've never seen my mom act like that. It's almost like that sort of schizophrenia. You don't really know them, right? But the real people that don't have that schizophrenia are the ones that shine exactly a perfect mirror, like you, like you say, a perfect mirror of what is going on inside, outside. Those words, the things that they choose, how they choose to interact with others, what they choose to say, how they choose to give it to people so it can be received, how they choose to carry themselves are but that reflection of creation into the material. So this immaterial level of consciousness and spirit are coming through into this function of me creating a tone to represent everything that is happening inside of me. So when I choose to talk to you, if I choose to use words that founded around me or principles of unity, love, happiness, equalization, right? 
egalitarianism, all of those things, peace, knowledge, wisdom, truth, those things do not create a sense of separation. All of those things come together for an uplifting, progressive, unifying purpose. So if I continue to talk like that all the time, it reforms my consciousness and my subconsciousness. It removes that clouded aspect of this material world that would be blocking the spirit and causing me to have this sort of schizophrenia where it's only a function of me in the material rather than a sense of I am in the totality of the self. Yeah, I looked at it as, and I wrote this down last night, uh, renewing to our free will. And so the first step is, you know, we all would like steps and bullet points, you know, in this Western philosophy that yeah. we have, you know. I like a bullet point. Um, but, you know, renewing to our free will. So how do we, because that's the whole idea is, is, is being reborn in, you know, I mean, that's what, when you look at reincarnation, yep. if we want to use that word, I, I, I want us to come up with a better word than reincarnation because that word has been so diluted. It's like your belief word. Yeah. I think reincarnation, there's just so much dogma with it. Yeah, no, there is a lot of dogma with it. So let's use a, an actual physical example uh, that we have that you'd seen that was used by the Knights Templar and other groups that had more intimate knowledge of creation. They had this idea of an ego death. Not in the sense where I need to eradicate it altogether, but to find a realization, a rebirth of knowledge, an enlightenment factor that said, oh, I'm moving away from me and into the world of I am, the totality of self, the unity of self. So what they would do is that for three days before the equinox, they would put these people in resonant caves and they cut off all light and you were just there. You were with yourself, your thoughts, and the visual images that went through that mind. And then, you know, you go through these ups and downs, right? These periods of fear or, you know, like joy, and you feel you experience everything in that darkness. It's actually, it's like a sensory deprivation experience for mm -hmm. three days. And then you wake up on the equinox after that ego has died, and you realize that the first thing you see is that rising moon or that rising sun, whatever that thing might be on the horizon, and the only thing you're faced with when you're there is this giving part of creation. So you've essentially left that schizophrenic, egoic old self behind. And you, you come out, you're born now into this world, you're rebirthed in your understanding of consciousness and spirit. And the first thing you get is this image of the universe in front of you. Something that is so grand and so large and so giving all the time. And that's the very first picture you see after you have this metaphorical death. And so as you go through that experience, that's the thing that was shared by so many cultures and, you know, occult practices over time is how do we remove people from that schizophrenia nature or that material first nature and show them the real deeper everlasting truth that is actually occurring? How do we get them to experience that? And the old cultures had a way of sensory deprivation. Now I can lay in a, you know, like almost like a hyperbaric tank with salt water and float. I can't feel the weight of my body. I can't feel anything, right? And it's completely silent, totally black. That's our new age way of doing it. But for them, you're outside, laying inside this huge piece of stone or inside the queen's chamber of a pyramid. And you're going through this process. You're removing that schizophrenia. You're removing the paradox of self that doesn't need to belong. Because once you realize unity, all paradoxes are solved. If you see that there is the law of one, there is no such thing as a paradox. A paradox is just us assuming that there are separate aspects of this universe of creation. Does that, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, the paradox of self. I'm, I'm, well, that's what, I, when you say schizophrenia to me, I, I, it feels like the paradox of self. No, yeah, I'm looking at it um, in the sense of trying to bring it into more of a um, practical instead of the ethereal. Uh, yes. So whenever I talk about renewing to our free will, then number one, if we want to sub point, would be full responsibility. Yeah, well, full responsibility for your thoughts. Right. And then with those thoughts, how do I define who I am? How do I define me as Jason? You need to take responsibility for that. And you shouldn't let that be defined, have the material world define that for you. So free or will. others define it for free you. Free will and responsibility. Let, mm -hmm. Let's, before we get heavy into this. So, because I'm going to, there's, there's, there's a burden that people are carrying right now because they're not taking 100% responsibility. And we'll get into that. But the free will and responsibility, that that double-edged sword. Yeah. That If you want to call it that. That's what it is. Yeah. So free will responsibility. When, whenever you're looking at taking 100% responsibility 
for every action that you're committing. And thought. Yeah, and thought, because that's what you're doing. You're committing to that thought in yes. your illusion. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you, yeah. because that it, the commitment to thought creates action in your stream of probabilities or stream of cause and effect. Yes. The question yeah, yeah. is: Are you going to be? Res- are you going to say I'm actually responsible for this chain of cause and effect, or am I going to pass off that responsibility? And and it's so funny because we have a map in front of us. We always tell you guys that, but this full global map, and and you can see right here, a construct of society agreeing not to take 100 percent responsibility. And, and you can that see this is a phenomenal systemic, metaphor. Yeah, the systematic approaches to what is happening when we go against creational laws. Yeah, it, a border, right? Uh, just a border in and yeah, of itself yeah, yeah. is anti-creational. No, no, the border is a validation of us. Well, taking responsibility. No, it, it, of us collectively saying let's go against humanity's free will. Oh, well, that's correct. And say I only be, I only want to be somewhat responsible for this. But what I realize is that there's really no border here. I can't say that the difference of 50 feet between me and Canada or me and Mexico eradicates all responsibility. But but it's like the matrix I talk about. That's an illusion that you've chose to believe. And then we've got a collective conscious together that chose to believe that there's a line in the... I know. And then we've, <laughs> what we've done is we've thought about that thought form and then we've put it on paper here yes. to define what we say is a map. Yeah. And, if and, I go up in space, right? I want to continue with this example because it's fantastic and I'm so glad you brought it up. If I go in space as an astronaut, and I look down, are there red lines everywhere that tell me where's Argentina and Brazil? Is there something that shows me where Bolivia is as opposed to, you know, where Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia ends and Yemen begins? No. no I'm but looking how, at, how many people have died against their free will for that illusion? For that illusion that somebody owns this area, that there is some line of demarcation. And let's stay here because we just listened to Paul Check talk about, um, he was just quoting the law of one mm-hmm. raw about the thought form creating. Yes. And how they created the pyramids. Mm -hmm. And now our thought form through this border creating. Yeah. And that's what we did, right? So we came together as a collective to say, let's focus on what we define as a boundary. Let's focus on what we think we own. (laughs) Us. Okay. Specific us. Like Uh, you can actually own the globe. Yeah. Like, and I can, well, people feel that they can own the globe. Like you actually even have property. Governments <laughs> feel like they can own, you know, places. In, you think you own your home? <laughs> you don't own your home. A bank owns your house. You, a bank doesn't even own it. No, and the a bank, tornado and, can come. A tsunami. <laughs> it it shows you how fragile and weak these thoughts of ownership right. are in the material sense, right? And then when we and but here's here's the funny part: we're so willing to own land and material things, but nobody's willing to own their thoughts. Yeah, I was watching that tsunami. Words. I was watching that tsunami in Japan where all the dead bodies were floating all around. I didn't even you know in the water. Bodies. It's a crazy picture. You should see it. Um, but in, I didn't even realize how many people. Um, the big tsunami in Indonesia that was like 2004, 2005. Right. We you know we saw the pictures. It was horrific, and we saw the big wave coming, and people are partying, having fun. You know, even though they were warned. And we see this monster, you know, hundreds of feet of water coming in on them, you know, and mm-hmm. they're running to no avail. But people don't realize how many people died. There was 275,000 people that died over that one tsunami. Do you know how people feel? That's when, a quarter of a million people think, died like that. Do you, how do people feel when they go to a funeral when one person dies? Yeah, exactly. Think about 275,000 dying at the same but time. But all those people that felt like they owned in that beach in Indonesia, you those don't. resorts. None, you don't own gone. any of it. The it, whole beach went. Like the, that all you, the sand went. Back into the ocean. It's an, it's, and it's an easy point to say that stop fighting Mother Nature. You lose every single time. You're fighting yourselves. It's schizophrenic. You're creating a But paradox. Alex, I get validation off of that. What validation? Where does your validation come from? Does it come from a diluted perspective of what reality truly is? Do you get validation from others telling you who you are? Or are you going to stand and define for yourself what you are, how you choose to live, and what to live with? It's 100% my choice. It's 100% your choice. It's free will? Yeah. No. It's, not for, it's not for anyone else to no. decide for you. Can you decide what you want to learn? Of course you can. And then can people together decide that that's not a border anymore? Yes, absolutely. Wow. It's just about everybody coming together and say, this is not the reality. So would we call this knowingness? <laughs> yeah, I would call this knowingness. I, I, it starts with, first, it, it starts with self-cognition, self-awareness, right? And then it takes the step to multiple people doing that and then coming together and be like, let's be aware together. And then we have this collective knowingness. Could you imagine if all of our brains came together and just focused on one thing? 
how effective we would be. Yeah, climate stability. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, educational access, human rights, global peace, public health, <laughs> government, and corporate transparency. These are our sponsor, Tartle.co. Yeah. <laughs> These are this is why you need to go to sign up Tartle.co. Um, sign up and you can share your data. Remove which those. You're, yeah. Which you're already doing anyways. Yeah, remove the And border. then you can give them to those causes. Yeah, give them to the causes that help remove those borders, that help peop, the 275,000 people that were affected, you know, yeah, in their, or the families, 275,000 yeah. oh, yeah. families that were affected. So let, let me ask you this, Alex, in this knowingness, but, you know, the United Nations with this border, we'll stick with this example. The United Nations and all those borders and stuff, they know better. Of course they, they do. know better. There's why, a, why do we why do we give away our free will? When, and and then why do we think that other people know better than us when we all have the same creational power that is in us through a recognition of awareness to creational laws? Why do they still do that? I think it's egoic. You know, I, I think that's where we're letting the monkey mind. I think go. there's, I think there's this this sort of idea that they probably have is that the world needs to be controlled because if someone isn't controlling it, it'll fall to chaos. And do they have an example of that? Is there a pertinent example? And the reason I say this is if we are evolving in our consciousness every day, and as Imagine if we did this. Every step we took forward in the evolution of consciousness, we would remove one global controlling ide- ideology mm. at the same time. It's tit for tat, okay? As one increases, the other needs to decrease. You know, it's that, it's that natural, it's that law of equilibrium, right? So I, I, would, I would guess that it was in their idea that we need to have borders. People, they're probably saying people need to have this sense of, control and limits because when you give them the ability to be unlimited Mm -hmm. or think unlimited that could cause a lot of problems that could turn into something with great amounts of anarchy and maybe they feel right maybe there are some quite knowing people right that run these whatever global thing it might be and maybe they're like people aren't ready maybe society hasn't done enough introspection yeah but i think but but here's the but here's the thing is it for you to choose when people are ready? Is it right for a government to choose when you're ready to do something? Well, is I it, mean, that, that's, that's you've what been I have to war, right here. Right? Pa- power over you. You've been to war. Right. You, uh, but the opposite of free will, and I wrote this down, is caged will. That's, yeah, that's the will. The is cage, If you picture a cage, mm. you know, you like caged will. So the opposite of free will and then power over you. Those are all illusions. Every the reason we go to war is because of an illusion that there's a threat. What if you're? What if there's a draft? I have no choice. Yeah, that's going against your so, free will. Like, 100%. first of all, it goes against my free will, and if I don't go, you lock me up. Yeah, caged will. Yeah, but I mean, I, I'm looking at okay. So we've agreed that this is a border, and then we've turned around and said, okay, now we have to have. We're having an argument. Peace talks aren't working. Let's send troops in. That whole process is all an illusion. Peace talks aren't working. <laughs> so because peace isn't working, we need to come in and put military force. But, but, but listen to what you just said. Peace isn't working. Peace always works. Peace always works. The thing is, you are coming in without the idea of peace. If you truly came in in a unifying nature and all these other things, you wouldn't have to go in with a gun. No. You wouldn't have to roll in with tanks or airplanes or drones or satellites or chemical warfare, or any of those things. Well, it, it also, and, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say this because we can go back to this, um, and we'll, we'll we'll keep it at this macro view, and then go personal. But the victimization, this country's doing this to me. You see what I'm saying? So this creates that spiritual schizophrenia because now we're going back into this egoic mind where it's like, I I need to defend myself because this is happening to me. What do you mean it's happening to you? What going on in South Sudan is having something directly happen to you here in the United well, States? Well, we know a lot of this stuff is monetarily. I mean, it's yeah, all, all economic. If you look at it, it's all economic. Most wars are economic. Well, that, that's why the people who fund wars fund both sides. <laughs> yes. They don't care if you win or lose, they get paid. You know what I mean? But why? What, it, what is a paradox? A paradox is a logically self-contradictory statement. Or, a, you know, a statement that runs contrary to one's expectation of reality. A 
Okay. So if I have reality, but my expectation is different, mm. that means this paradox is not the truth. Yeah, I, I, I have here leadership um, empowers victimhood. Our current leadership. Our current leadership does. It, that's what it's empowering the victimhood. You know, the that gentleman. Because now I need now I need you. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I can't solve the problem through my own free will. I can't take responsibility. Or I don't want to take responsibility. And so now I'm relying on my will is caged. And now I need an external source to come in. Let me out of that cage. And let me out of that cage because you're the only one that has the key. And our whole podcast is about saying, no, you have the key holding right in your hand. You have the <laughs> big ass skeleton key. <laughs> yes. Unlock your, you, you know, you put your hand through the iron bars. Right. Put them through to the other side and unlock the thing. 